Well, hi, Cynthia. Thank you for joining me today. I'm very interested to hear about your campaign for Boulder Valley School Board in District C. But first, tell us a little bit about yourself. Right. Uh, well, I am um, a, a mom of, of two boys who I, I'm an older mom and my boys are now both in high school in Boulder Valley. They've attended uh, public schools all their all their lives since kindergarten. And um, I was I, I was generally happy with their education. I worked I, I volunteered in the classroom when they were in elementary school and I thought they had a really good experience. In, in BVSD, which is the acronym for our school district. Uh, it's when COVID struck that I started to pay attention and I was not so happy. And I was listening to um, school board meetings regularly, which were online. And so in Boulder Valley, students, at least older students from the middle school level and above were out of school uh, effectively for a year. They were, during that time, Later in that first year, from March 2020 through March 2021, they were allowed back maybe one to two days a week for some periods. Um, but they even in um, fall, late fall and winter of 2020, they were basically shut out of school altogether. Um, and this was really hard on on a lot of kids, including especially my younger son. Um, and then. They did bring children back to school after spring break of 2021 for four days a week, and then for five days a week starting the fall of 2021. But the children were in mandatory masks for six to seven hours a day. And I would even routinely see this at the uh, elementary school near my home where little children, you know, five years old were playing even during outdoor recess in their masks. Um, and I, um, in winter of 2021, they, BVSD created this position called a classroom monitor, which was basically an adult who was willing to sit in the classroom, which is required by law, while students logged into remote teachers um, online. And so I, I worked one day a week in addition to my day job, I'm, I'm a PhD, uh, researcher in environmental science, but I really felt strongly that kids needed to get back in the classroom, and there was a call to the community to step forward and fill these roles. So I I did it, and um, it was very enlightening and disturbing to me to see what was going on in these socially distanced, ma mandatory masked classrooms, and I just thought they were scenes in many cases of desolation. You know, especially when I watched the high school students spending their their school years, these formative years, sitting socially distanced, isolated and masked at desks, staring at screens. Um, and I, I remember in particular one incident where after class, one student said to the other, hey, would you like to have lunch with me? And the other student said, no. I don't eat lunch because I'm afraid to take my mask off. So I think there was just, you know, sort of an undue inst instilling of fear into these students. And they really weren't in danger from the COVID virus. They have, a, you know, children have a 99.997% survival rate. Um, and just the public health response put the heaviest burden on those who were, who were at least risk from COVID, which was the children. And they, you know, they were telling them that they were a threat to their teachers, um, their grandparents. And this is just not borne out in the evidence. You know, for example, in Sweden, they did not shut down the schools. They did not forcibly mask the children. And Sweden fared relatively well compared to other Western countries in its COVID death rate. Um, and while doing much less harm to its children. So, you know, that the COVID experience was really the, re the reason that, uh, among others, that um, motivated me to enter this race. And I, I had hoped that there would be other candidates who felt the same way I, I do, because there are, these seats are completely open, these four seats. The incumbents have either been term limited or have chosen not to run for reelection. Um, and yet I've attended now three candidate forums 
And it's become sadly clear that I, you know, they often have a, a series of rapid fire, yes, no questions. Often the response, I'm the only one uh, saying either yes or no, and all the others are in lockstep uh, agreeing to things like, for example, one of the ones that's come up twice is if students are transitioning their gender at school and, and using different pronouns at school, should the parents be informed? And I'm the only one who says, yes, the parents must be informed. Everyone else says no. Um, wow. Another question was, will you defer to public health authorities on mask mandates and future vaccine mandates? I said, not only no, but absolutely no. Um, everyone else says yes. And, you know, it's been interesting at the, the forums. I think there has been a deliberate campaign by my one of my opponents. I, I'm running against two people um, to paint me as a, an, as an anti-vaxxer because one of my opponents always brings up his support for public health, his unwavering, unquestioning support for public health, um, even in incongruous contexts. Um, so it's it's almost like he's been coached to say this. Um, and yeah, so it's I you know I didn't I wasn't running on vaccines, but somehow the my opponent has made this an issue. And it um, came up in particular as a dominant theme in a forum a, a couple of weeks ago where I think there were planted questions in the audience about vaccines. And um, the funny thing about that was I think the strategy backfired because I clearly knew a lot more about the subject than the other candidates. You know, I, I pointed out, for example, that we've gone from 24 disease doses prior to granting a blanket liability from prosecution to vaccine manufacturers. You know, after that, that was in 1986, the, the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act was passed, provided liability protection from lawsuits for the manufacturers. That's when the schedule started to explode. And now we went from 24 disease doses, and now we're up to at least 90 with the addition of the COVID vaccine, which I think is for children, which I think is unethical because it's all risk, no benefit for them. Um, you know, and possibly 108 if they want children to get two of these per year. We don't know how many per year they, they want. They say it's an annual shot, but since the the vaccine only really lasts for a few months. What's the point of getting getting it annually? You need to get a booster every few months to really have have the effect. So, um, yeah, it's let's just say the candidate forums have been interesting. <laughs> wow. Well, I must really commend you for a running in Boulder with a strong pro freedom, pro medical freedom uh, message. I think a lot of parents hopefully are responding well to that and realizing that, you know, it's important to be an advocate for the kids. There was so much undue harm on the mental health of, of so many young people during those COVID years. And uh, it's great to see you stepping up and speaking out in defense of these children. But it seems also unfortunate that a lot of people just don't don't get it, don't get the harm that was caused to, to all these school kids. Yeah, they 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 don't. And I um I I'll show a couple of slides. Let's see. No, this is not advancing. Oh, here we go. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I was at the end of my show. All right. I just wanted to show a few slides because I was very curious about what has happened to uh, what what kind of pandemic learning loss occurred in Boulder Valley. Because on the national level, this is a this is an article from the Associated Press that came out this summer. And nationally, and even in the state of Colorado, I've read articles that confirm that there, there was a, you know, a generational drop in math and reading scores. They've fallen to the lowest level in decades. That's according to federal testing. Um, on average, students are, I believe, about four months behind academically, but uh, Black and Hispanic students are more like five to six months behind academically. So the achievement gaps that Boulder is, is always talking about closing achievement gaps. Um, and they, they are, the racial achievement gaps are large in Boulder County. I, I was somewhat shocked to see how large they were when I delved into the data. But anyway, these achievement gaps are widening, not closing post pandemic. 
as students are struggling to recover. And there's also an, an issue of chronic truancy and absenteeism. Uh, there was an article just the other day in the Colorado Sun that said um, chronic truancy, which is defined as a student missing 10% or more of classroom days, uh, that the historical uh, rate of truancy had been about 18 to 24% in Colorado. And in 21-22, uh, it was up to 36%. And this, this past year, it's still elevated at 31%. So it's, you know, compared to the historic norm of about 20%. So a lot of students just got in the habit of not attending school when they were pushed online. And um, some of those students have not, you know, gotten back into the school habit. So I think we've really done generational damage to our students, especially to those who are most, who are least advantaged, you know, who are, who are low income, whose parents did not have internet connections or who were not able to teach them at home during the pandemic. Um, but nobody wants to talk about that in this race. I even had one question on a questionnaire saying it was they, the, the only time somebody asked about pandemic learning loss, it was in sort of an apologetic way, saying something like this is, I realize this is no longer a hot button issue, but you know, please comment on pandemic learning loss. So I tried to look into um, uh, what what has actually happened in Boulder Valley with with the pandemic, and I had to submit a CORA request. And the what they gave me were the the so called I Ready scores. I don't know if other districts do I the I Ready tests, but they test um, a student's reading level at the beginning, middle, and end of the year. And this is kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth grade. This is a snapshot for twenty twenty. To 2021 school year. And so you kind of see how the students' reading scores uh, grow over time. Um, but I, so I took these data, they gave them to me for about six different academic years, and I plotted, um, plotted them versus school year. And that's what I'm showing in this graph. So now we're plotting versus school year for individual grades, kindergarten, first, second, third. And I just noticed this interesting feature in, in this graph where there was actually a bump in the reading score for the youngest kids, especially kindergarten and first grade, in August of uh, 2020, which is, you know, after coming back from a, the summer of lockdowns, where parents were home with their kids. And what I've discovered is there's little curiosity uh, among the school officials to explain what is happening here. I don't think they even knew, they hadn't plotted the data in this way. And I asked them, well, can you explain this big bump to me? And they said, well, I don't know, but I think it might've been because we introduced a new read reading module in 2019. And, huh? Because if that were true, why did the, sc the scores go back down again in 2021, 22? And presumably you're still using that reading module so some people looking in the, at this have suggested to me that um, this is the result of parents being home with their young children and reading to them. Is that possible? I don't know. So it's so it's very interesting. And um, I guess to make a long story short, I've I've taken some pains to look at our academic performance data in BBSD, and I have not found a smoking gun or an obvious sign of devastating loss in academic skills. And on the contrary, it seems like they, the skills rose at, you know, after that summer of lockdown. So um, this could be because, I, it, there could be some, you know, issues going on with the data, like such as they're only testing the most elite students in these, in these um, post-pandemic tests or this could reflect the influence of parents. And in any case, um, I think parents need to be involved in, in all decisions affecting their children, especially um, their, their children's health. Uh, and we know there's, there's a movement to introduce school-based health centers at school where schools will be administering vaccines, um, psychological evaluations, et cetera, of, uh, for students. And 
by doing this at school, it becomes a lot easier to do this without the parents' knowledge and consent. And I was even asked a question about this, um, you know, should at one of the forums, should uh, school-based nurses be catching children up on their vaccines? Um, and I, I said, no, not without parental knowledge and consent. And again, all the other candidates thought it was a great idea to you know, uh, have the, the school-based health centers um, administering vaccines to students. Wow. Yeah, that's incredible. It seems that there is, uh, you know, uh, a trend where so many school administrators or teachers or just school staff trying to take the place of parents, really push parents out of the picture and, and decide what's best for the children. And, you know, of course, you know, do these people really have the best interests for the children at hand? Sometimes maybe, but, you know, who who's going to have the better interest than just the parents, right? Right, exactly. And that's and that that that's what I've said in questions about um, hiding gender transition from parents, because I, and I've been cast as an anti-trans kids' rights. And I, you know, I, I don't, I, I support students. I'm, my concern is for the well-being of students. And I, I guess I come at the, the gender transition question from the lens of somebody who's seen what's happening in the in the vaccine realm, we have a movement across the country uh, where I think naive legislators are introducing legislation to allow effectively allow pharma direct access to children. You know, allowing children as young as twelve years old to make decisions uh, without the knowledge of their parents, um, and it's it's couched as being, you know all to help the child, to help the child's mental health and so on. Um, but I think there's a there's a darker underside where they are, you know, the parent is often the only person standing between the pharmaceutical industry and a vulnerable child. And you know, they're trying to push child push parents out of the way. And there was a, there was a, even a law passed in Washington, DC that would allow children as young as 12 to agree to vaccine vaccines without their parents' knowledge and consent. And it went a step further. They were going to create a separate medical record that would be shown to the parents that would hide the fact that that child had been given a vaccine at school. That law was overturned uh, because by a judge because it violated a federal, a federal law requiring informed consent by the parent. A parent sued whose, whose child had had a bad reaction at age five to a vaccine that required hospitalization the child was not aware of that and you know you have a lot of situations like that where a child may not know their early medical history and then you have schools uh trying to come in and administer pharma to these kids and even hide the fact from their parents um and thankfully that law was overturned but that illustrates the extreme lengths to which um you know, pharma and willing legislators are willing to go to come between that um, parent and child relationship. Wow. Yeah. Well, I think it's more important than ever for, for parents, for individuals to stand up in the community, to be an advocate for the children, you know, to, to stand up for parents as well. So many parents, uh, and I'm sure in Boulder County and everywhere else across Colorado are, are busy working. They don't necessarily take the time or the, the understanding to really dig into what's going on in their schools. You know, they unfortunately maybe trust too much what's happening in the schools away from the eyes of the parents. And a lot of parents need to realize it's not the exact, it's not the same environment. It's not the same school. Maybe when you were that age, things have changed a little bit out there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I think a lot of parents did start paying attention during COVID because they were seeing what was being streamed into their child's classroom. And, and, you know, that's another issue I just wanted to mention briefly was, is declining enrollment. Uh, because we have a, a significant declining enrollment problem in Boulder. And um, a, a big part of that is the fact that housing here is unaffordable. And I have, um, actually, I have another, I realized I had another slide that I wanted to show. Let me bring that back up. Um, basically, Boulder voters have always very generously supported high local taxes to support schools um, 
let's see, do you see this graph here? Let me put it yes, in. Yes, I can I can see that. Yeah, this this um so there there's a by state law, the a school receives a certain amount of money per pupil. And there, there's a base rate in that of I believe it's eight thousand dollars per pupil, and that can be embellished if if it's a district with a high cost of living. So effectively in in Boulder, our per pupil rate is something on the order of ten thousand um, dollars. And then there is a split in in who pays that money between the state and the local property taxes. And if if there's if there are high local property taxes, then the state feels like it doesn't have to put in as much money. And you can see that Boulder is really an outlier in receiving a very small fraction of its per pupil funding from state funding and most of it from property tax. And then there's also mill levy overrides that are bringing in extra money. And I know I personally, whenever a, a local ballot measure comes up to provide more money for schools, I'm just, you know, I'm always checking the box, yes, because I, and I think many voters are like me, we want to support our schools. But I think we're unwittingly and ironically uh, contributing to a situation in which we have um, very high property values and and high property taxes, which are, you know, again, ironically contributing to the unaffordable housing situation in Boulder, which is driving out young families and contributing to a declining enrollment problem, which which then uh, deprives our schools of, of funding. So it's kind of a you know, a, an unfortunate situation. And I, I think we really need to critically think about how we are funding our schools rather than keep increasing our taxes endlessly. We, you know, we need to really rethink what we're doing here and hopefully get into a more sustainable funding model for our schools. Um, and then there's the, there's the other issue with declining enrollment, which I won't go into all the data I've, I've, analyze, but I, I think about 20% of our problem is due to parents who are deliberately pulling their children from public schools because they don't like the direction the schools are headed. And, um, you know, the, the evidence for that is uh, historically about 95% of the children born in the county, in Boulder County, five years prior, show up in kindergarten in the public schools. But in last year, only 89% of those kids did. Um, so there's, you know, there's some 6% of the parents who are just not sending their children to public schools. And I've talked to a number of those parents um, who are who have decided to homeschool or go to a private school, and they are not happy with the schools. They're not happy with the focus on social, what they see as social agendas as opposed to academics. So my position there is we need to win back the trust of these parents by accommodating their needs, by listening to their concerns, backing off of the social agendas and focusing, refocusing on academics. So that's also a big, a big part of my platform. And I, you know, I'm coming at this from somebody who believes in public schools, who wants to fight for public schools. Um, I've always gone to public schools um, all my life, my, myself. Um, and you know, I just worry that we're headed for a more divided society if we continue to have this fraction, increasing fraction of parents who are who are, who feel unheard, disenfranchised, and are pulling their children from the schools. So, you know, I hope to address that by being a voice on the school board that those parents can talk to and and can be assured that their concerns will be heard and they will not be judged negatively. Um, as haters, for example, that came up in a forum where parents who were who did not like the um, early introduction of uh, sexual identity, LGBTQ, you know, teaching in the schools, and that that's now in the Colorado curriculum, recommended as young as as pre K, um, and student or parents who objected to that were were described were characterized as haters in a candidate forum I attended recently. And I said, I don't think it's fair to call these parents haters. These are loving parents who are concerned about their children and don't want this early sexualization of their children in the schools. And, you know, I think that if we sat down and talked, we'd, we'd realize that we're all loving parents who are concerned about children. And that kind of name calling, I, I just don't think is fair or appropriate. 
Yeah. Well, I really appreciate the the time and effort you've taken to really get a, a macro view or a bigger understanding of what's going on in Boulder schools. And I'm sure this is a similar situation in schools across Colorado, where you have high property taxes pushing out, you know, working class families. And then, of course, a segment of the population not wanting to participate in this social agenda that they see as maybe threatening to their values. And, mm-hmm. you know, I think I think your your the solution is there is is a diversity of opinion is bringing people together. You know, we're supposed to be this great melting pot society. So to have other voices come in to invite people in the community into these school boards, you know, that you can represent and say, hey, you know, let's let's just talk about this. Let's figure it out. Let's all come together as, as individuals, as loving parents and and figure out what's best for our children without without the divisiveness. I think that is a message that is very important, especially in this extremely polarized society we have. And and you you said something I, that really struck with me too is that public schools have been a key point in terms of like keeping society together, I guess is how I interpret it. You know, where kids from different backgrounds, different neighborhoods can come together, learn how to get along, learn how to to function as a society, you know, and put our differences aside and and achieve uh, academic success. And I think that's the, the one of the best things that public schools provides for the community. And, and it's unfortunate to see what's been happening, but I hope that people respond to your message and people come up um, out to vote in uh, November here. And uh, let's get some diversity of opinion and thought on Boulder Valley School District. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and, and I think I was quoting Abraham Lincoln when when he said that public schools are essential for the perpetuation of our democratic republic, because that is where people from all backgrounds, children come together and learn to get along. And, um, you know, and I, I will be, if elected, I will be a school board member for all children. I'm not, you know, I'm I'm not strongly political one way or another, um, and I'm willing to listen to all viewpoints, a diversity of viewpoints, and I I just hope to be, you know, to bring some balance to the school board. Well, Cynthia, how can people support your campaign? Um, well, again, I'll go back to my um, uh, website. Uh, you can make a donation to my campaign. Um, if you live in Boulder Valley and would like a yard sign, please let me know. You can contact me through my website. And I think probably most important of all is just word of mouth. If you want to see someone like me on the school board, um, vote for me and tell your friends to vote for me, because I think word of mouth is the only way I'm going to win this race. I'm not the anointed candidate endorsed by the teachers union in this race. I am in a three-way race, so the a plurality of the vote will win the race. Uh, I I don't, you know, I conceivably could win with 40, 45 percent of the vote um, if things go well. So that's what I'm hoping for. Yeah, and I think it's important for understand, you know, no matter where you're at in Colorado, you don't have to live in Boulder to to contribute to Cynthia's campaign. If you know anybody in Boulder, you can definitely share this video and pass the word along. So Cynthia, thank you so much for your time. I wish you the best of luck and take care. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me.